you're up here and anybody hits the back of my patrol car, it's a good chance you're going to get caught somewhere between that car and your car. I don't want that to happen to you. Just like that, see? Just like that. Accidents with injuries, hazardous material spills, dangerous weather conditions, they can all cause major traffic congestion that often leads to other accidents. I know that all too well. My name is Tim Hayes and I used to be a paramedic. My career came to an end in 2003 when I was responding to a minor accident along I-77 in northern Mecklenburg County. While I was tending to a patient, a tractor trailer slid on ice hit my ambulance and pinned me between the guardrail and the ambulance, severing both of my legs. Thanks to my partner's medical skills, I am alive today. I can no longer work as a paramedic, but I can use my experience and knowledge to help make first responders like you more aware of the importance of scene safety. The goal of this training video is to show you how to balance scene safety with motorist safety. We'll explain how you can help protect your fellow first responder and motorists by reducing traffic congestion and secondary incidents. Secondary accidents involving first responders are a growing problem in North Carolina. They don't just happen in big cities where traffic congestion is common, they happen in small rural areas too. Any accident anywhere can cause traffic backups. And if that congestion isn't quickly and effectively handled, it puts you and the other responders on scene at risk. This is such a serious issue that several agencies are pushing for improvement. The first group is the state's Executive Committee for Highway Safety, which is made up of representatives from the North Carolina Department of Transportation, Office of State Fire Marshal, North Carolina Community College System, North Carolina Office of Emergency Management, North Carolina State Highway Patrol, Towing and Recovery Professionals of North Carolina, Governor's Highway Safety Program, North Carolina Trucking Association, Office of Emergency Medical Services, and many others. The committee supports the recent fender bender, move over, and quick clearance laws, which give law enforcement agencies the leverage they need to safely and efficiently handle incidents. The fender bender law states that when motorists are involved in minor incidents with no injuries, they must move their vehicles to the shoulder of the road or out of the path of traffic unless their cars are too damaged to drive under their own power. The move-over law states that drivers must move to an adjacent lane or slow down and be prepared to stop when approaching emergency vehicles with lights flashing. This includes both emergency response vehicles and public service vehicles such as tow operators and incident management assistance patrols that are responding to emergency scenes. The quick clearance law deals with getting vehicles out of the roadway. The law states that if law enforcement and NCDOT agree that a vehicle and its cargo pose a safety concern, they can move it by any means necessary without facing liability. In addition to backing those laws, the committee also received a FEMA grant, which made today's training possible. Another well-recognized group that's implementing change is the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. Based on NFPA 1901 requirements for 2009, all new fire equipment must meet specific criteria. At least half the rear service must be covered in chevron striping, and it must have at least five 28-inch tall traffic cones that meet the conditions of high-speed traffic. Using funding from FEMA, the Executive Committee for Highway Safety is working to share best practices for using this equipment with all response agencies in North Carolina. The additional agencies working to reduce highway fatalities are the U.S. Department of Transportation and the U.S. Fire Administration. USFA released training modules in 2008 that reinforced the strong need to unify all response agencies and standardize how they react to incidents on North Carolina's roadways. Those agencies have been working together on incidents since roads were first built. The team mentality may be the same as it was back then, but the conditions are not. The cars and trucks are bigger, they're going faster, and there are more of them on the roads today than in the past. That means you face a greater risk as soon as you set foot on scene. 
So in the interest of safety, it's crucial that we create a parking order for responders as they arrive in their vehicles. But to understand how that parking order is organized, you'll need to be familiar with some basic terms that we'll use throughout this training. The first two terms will help you determine your location by using the scene as a reference point. So, if you're upstream of an incident, you're on the side of the incident where traffic is approaching you. If you're downstream of an incident, you're on the side of the incident where traffic is going away from you. The next term you need to know is transition area. It's the area where traffic is moved out of its normal path and redirected around the scene. In an emergency situation, you typically redirect traffic with a taper, which is basically a line of orange cones placed to show traffic which way to move around the scene. You can also use a properly positioned response vehicle, such as a fire or rescue vehicle with flashing lights, or both. NCDOT recommends you follow this example when setting up your taper with traffic cones. Start by taking five traffic cones and walking upstream along the side of the road for five pavement skips. These skips are 10 feet long and spaced 30 feet apart, so you'll use the cones to install a 200-foot taper. If you have more cones, then continue adding one skip line for each additional cone. While keeping an eye on traffic at all times, place the first cone on the solid edge line in line with the fifth pavement skip. As you walk back towards the edge of the vehicle, blocking the incident scene, place the cones in a straight, diagonal line spaced at each skip line. The last cone should be at or near the edge of the blocking vehicle on the center of the skip line. That way motorists will understand what to do as they approach the scene. After the scene is cleared, you'll need to remove the traffic cones using the following method. Start by picking up the cone closest to the cleared incident and walk towards oncoming traffic along the inside of the taper. Pick up cones until you reach the cone on the solid shoulder line. Remember, you'll always face traffic as you retrieve the cones. Once you're done, walk back to the vehicle with the cones while keeping an eye on traffic. This is only one example of a temporary traffic taper. For long-term incidents, it should be replaced with properly spaced traffic control and assistance from NCDOT. Now let's look at the terms used in positioning response vehicles properly, which allows you to achieve two things. First, you'll keep motorists from entering the scene. Second, by placing a fire or rescue vehicle on the upstream side of the incident, you'll create a physical barrier between you and traffic. Oncoming motorists will see the vehicle's warning lights and know to slow down and move safely around the incident. There are different ways to block traffic using your vehicle. To block left means your vehicle is angled left towards the median. To block right means your vehicle is angled to the right towards the outside shoulder of the road. In addition to alerting motorists, the blocking vehicle will also create a buffer space. That's the protected area where first responders can properly perform their duties. Think of the area as a shadow. As long as you're within the shadow, you're protected from traffic. Stay within this area at all times when you're performing duties that keep you from being able to watch traffic. Now that we've reviewed the important terms for this training session, let's separate the agencies that would go to the scene of a typical traffic incident by when they arrive and their function. Fire and rescue departments usually get to the scene first because incidents are usually five miles or less from their station. Because fire and rescue usually face traffic congestion upon arrival, they're the agencies that should start making scene safety and traffic adjustments. These are their goals. Scene and personnel safety, patient extrication and treatment, fire and spill control, and environmental impact containment. Based on those goals, the appropriate place for them to park is on the upstream side of the incident, usually creating a 50 to 100 foot buffer space. At that distance, they can still deploy typical hose lines, as well as extrication equipment and electrical cords quickly and easily. Having fire and rescue park and respond on the upstream side is also a benefit during nighttime emergencies. Because their vehicles are equipped with overhead lighting, they can illuminate the scene without blinding the rear approaching traffic and other responding agencies. Next, let's consider the arrival of EMS transport agencies. They also get to the scene in the early stages of an incident, but they have different priorities, which include scene and personnel safety, rapid triage and treatment, 
evaluation of transportation priority and method, and safe transportation. To achieve those goals, EMS should park on the downstream side of the incident. This accomplishes several important things. First, it puts the EMS vehicle in a shadowed area protected from traffic. Second, it allows easy patient access without interfering in fire or rescue operations. And third, it gives the EMS vehicle excellent positioning to leave the scene quickly. This parking placement is also beneficial during severe incidents when EMS air transport is requested. Here's why. The downstream side of the road is a possible landing zone. But remember, the landing zone requirements of your typical aircraft response provider should determine if the site is appropriate. Now let's consider law enforcement. On interstates and divided highways, that can include the North Carolina State Highway Patrol or local law enforcement agencies. Their goals at the scene are scene and personnel safety, securing evidence and enforcing motor vehicle laws, information gathering and managing tow response, and clearing the scene and resuming traffic flow. Based on those goals, law enforcement agencies should park at a distance on the upstream side of the incident. That spot will provide motorists with advanced notification of the incident scene. It also places law enforcement vehicles in a good position to make adjustments or shifts to the traffic flow as needed. Next, let's address responders from the North Carolina Department of Transportation. For short-term incidents, Incident Management Assistance Patrols, or IMAP, will likely come to the scene in urban areas of the state. The IMAP unit was created to handle the following responsibilities. Set up short-term traffic control for other responders, clear debris including vehicles from the roadway, assist emergency responders, and restore traffic flow. The impact of an obstructed interstate can easily cost the local economy more than $100,000 an hour in inconvenienced workers, delayed trucking shipments, and missed appointments. IMAP can help alleviate traffic backups by quickly installing advanced traffic control upstream of the incident or rerouting traffic. Quick communication between agencies already at the scene and arriving IMAP drivers can help get traffic flowing more efficiently and reduce the threat of secondary incidents. Check after this training to see if IMAP is available in your area. For incidents like overturned tractor trailers, hazardous material spills, fatality investigations, and multiple vehicle accidents that last for longer periods of time, NCDOT maintenance or traffic services units should be contacted to assist with long-term traffic impacts. It takes time to mobilize equipment and resources. That's why it's important to decide what resources are needed at the scene early in the response plan so you can avoid causing unnecessary delays and or receiving help. It's not required for every scene, but input from NCDOT can help in a lot of different ways. Crews can assist other agencies with long-term traffic control and roadway clearing, return traffic to normal flow, protect the environment and public right-of-way, and assess and repair the roadway and other public property to its original condition. The last agency we need to examine is towing agencies. While often overlooked, it is a key part of the restoration phase. Their goals are scene and personnel safety, controlling and containing fluids, removing debris, and clearing the scene. Tow trucks often arrive at the scene when other agencies are demobilizing, so the best place for them to park is in the downstream position. That way, they'll be shadowed by the incident scene and out of the way during other phases of the incident. This location provides traffic flow protection from either law enforcement or NCDOT to ensure a safe recovery. All other resources and responders arriving on scene, such as media, hazmat crews, or additional fire and law enforcement vehicles should proceed to the furthest downstream position. This will extend the line, but will not add to traffic congestion. These additional resources will also be in a safer location from oncoming traffic. We've just looked at each agency and its on-team functions. Based on that information, it's easy to see that proper parking at the incident scene can allow those agencies to clear the scene faster and safer. But remember this, many agencies will be on scene at the same time, but only one agency can assume the lead role. And as that lead role changes, it is essential that you establish smooth communication between responders. Use of the incident command system is a required practice on all incident scenes. It'll help ensure that everyone leaves the scene sooner and safer. 
Now that we understand what each agency needs to accomplish, it is seen, let's focus on the primary goal of this training, improving the working conditions for the responders while minimizing the impact of traffic congestion. Doing so will reduce the chance for secondary incidents and fatalities outside of the immediate incident scene. It all starts with a fairly simple concept. Don't block traffic, manage it. By better managing traffic, you'll create a flow that allows additional resources to get to you faster. Here are some easy techniques for positioning responders. Think location, location, location. The place where responders park is what's important, not who arrives first. By staging vehicles in the proper locations, you can maximize both scene safety and motorist safety. Here is the correct parking order for most incidents. Fire and rescue units park immediately upstream of the incident. This blocks the traffic from entering the incident scene and directs traffic around the scene. That means the first fire or rescue unit would block the affected lane plus one additional lane to create a safe zone for responders to work. In some cases, that may only be the shoulder, such as in an incident where a car has run off the road. This should give you enough room to work safely during the most chaotic moments of the incident without totally stopping the flow of traffic or putting motorists in danger. If an incident happens on the shoulder of the road, the meaning of lane plus one changes slightly. In that case, the first unit to arrive would block the shoulder plus the adjacent lane only. You'd still allow traffic to pass, except in the cases of hazmat or other safety-related issues in which motorists could be harmed if allowed near the scene. In that type of situation, a secondary unit with fire, law enforcement, or NCDOT should immediately block the appropriate intersection or interchange upstream to keep traffic from coming into the area. Once the incident is under control, the lane plus one scenario may no longer apply. As soon as it's feasible to open unaffected lanes, move the vehicles immediately so traffic can drive past the scene safely. Also, minimize emergency lighting to reduce the effects of onlooker delay and driver distraction. And eliminate forward-facing lighting to minimize onlooker delay from the opposite side of the roadway. These things will help to reduce both unnecessary traffic congestion and onlooker delay, thus reducing the chance of secondary incidents due to long traffic backups. As we mentioned earlier, EMS should park just downstream of the incident for quick and safe patient treatment, loading, and transport from the scene. Towing should park even further downstream of the incident, so when EMS is done working, they'll be in a better position to clear the road. The other first responders' vehicles will also protect them from oncoming motorists. As law enforcement arrives, they should take over temporary traffic control duties. Since the blue light is the best for motorist compliance, it should be the first color a motorist sees when approaching an incident. NCDOT, when called on, should begin to install long-term traffic control. That includes appropriately signed lane closures, alternate routes, detours, arrow boards, message boards, and other traveler information devices. They'll help appropriately handle traffic during longer-term incidents, such as multiple vehicle accidents, fatality investigations, overturned tractor-trailer incidents, and hazardous material spills. Everyone else should proceed to the downstream position to park their vehicles. They should not park in the opposite direction of travel or on the opposite side of the road in the same direction of travel. Doing so will only further impede traffic and double the chances of secondary incidents and cause unnecessary congestion. Let's put this information to work in several realistic scenarios. First, we'll look at a routine medical or breakdown incident. You can handle these types of incidents on either the paved shoulder if it's wide enough or by closing one lane when you first get to the scene. The proper parking order goes like this. NCDOT if used, law enforcement, fire and or rescue, the incident itself, EMS, towing, and all other response agencies' vehicles. If one or more of those agencies does not respond, the remaining responders shouldn't change their position in the parking order. That way, all agencies will know where to go when they arrive on any wreck, thus minimizing confusion at the scene. As stated earlier, responding on the opposite side of the road or from the opposite direction of travel should be avoided to eliminate unnecessary traffic backups and secondary incidents. Now let's focus on how to handle an incident involving entrapment where vehicles are still in the roadway. 
The parking order is the same as noted in the previous example. NCDOT if used, law enforcement, fire and or rescue, the incident itself, EMS, towing, and any other response agency's vehicles. But in this scenario, the lane plus one response method should be used. If the shoulder is available, using it and the impacted lane may create enough of a lateral buffer to allow vehicles to pass. If it's not, moving the fire and rescue vehicles further over to create a larger shadow area is one option. Another is to access the vehicles from the shoulder side of the road. Either way, monitoring the traffic to balance motorist safety with responder safety should be assigned to someone at the scene, since this is a more volatile incident. The incident commander or delegate is responsible for four duties related to traffic impact. They are managing oncoming traffic, directing responders to the appropriate location to stage their vehicles and equipment, managing lighting to minimize onlooker delays, and watching for responders arriving from the opposite direction and disrupting traffic. Within 15 minutes of arrival, the person assigned to manage traffic should assess the incident's impact to traffic and the need for additional traffic control resources. For major incidents like overturned tractor trailers, multiple vehicle wrecks, fatality investigations, and hazardous material spills, contact NCDOT immediately so crews can respond with long-term term traffic control measures and other necessary equipment. For more minor incidents, contact NCDOT to provide IMAP short-term traffic control assistance, post messages on overhead message signs, and provide motorists with information through 511, NCDOT's toll-free traveler information line, and the media. In this scenario, we're looking at incidents that involve fire and hazardous materials. Because of their volatility, you may need to protect motorists from more than just traffic issues. Even though clearance times may be longer and the impact to traffic larger, the process is the same as in the other examples. But you'll probably need to contact NCDOT early on to assist in coordinating traffic and installing long-term traffic control. The department can alert the public to avoid the area or expect delays if they travel through it. If the hazard is serious enough to close the road completely, dispatch secondary units immediately to block additional traffic from being caught in the backup at the nearest interchange behind backed up traffic. Any agency can do this initially, but the responsibility should be turned over to law enforcement as soon as practical. If the incident will last more than an hour, NCDOT should be contacted to put out signs and conduct traffic control to warn motorists about the situation. Also, be sure to provide an exit for the traffic caught between the incident and the detoured exit. One way is to allow them to pass along the shoulder or around the incident. Or you can turn traffic around and merge them in with the detoured traffic up the exit ramp once traffic is under control and proper command is in place. Now let's discuss situations in which visibility is an issue. Incidents around curves over blind hills, fog, rain, snow, smoke, they can all be hazardous for both motorists and responders. If you can't see traffic within about 700 feet or roughly the length of two football fields of the blocking vehicle, take immediate steps to reposition the vehicles so drivers in oncoming traffic will know they're approaching an incident scene. Here's how you do it. Place another vehicle upstream in a more visible location or send a responder to wave down traffic and give drivers a visual cue that they're about to reach a hazardous situation. We've examined a lot of topics and scenarios throughout this video. Let's take a moment to review the important information we discussed so you'll be sure to remember it when you leave today's training. First, the arrival and placement of each agency's vehicles are designed to improve scene safety and performance while getting you out of danger as quickly as possible. Don't block lanes unnecessarily or park your vehicle in the wrong place. It not only slows down operations, but it also increases traffic congestion, the chance of secondary incidents, and the possibility that you or one of your colleagues could get hit by oncoming traffic or other response agencies at the scene. <laughs> I need an ambulance. Next, maintain unified command. 
We all have responsibilities at the scene, but to accomplish them effectively and efficiently, we must establish who the lead agency is and properly transfer responsibility of the scene, including traffic control, as time progresses. Then we must communicate frequently to support that lead role. And finally, for fire and rescue services, keep these five simple goals in mind. Do not respond to incidents from the opposite side of the road or from the opposite direction of travel due to safety issues for the motoring public. Place your vehicle in a blocking position to naturally shift the traffic flow and protect your work area. Attempt to deploy a 200-foot taper of traffic cones within five minutes of arrival. Call early for NCDOT support to provide traffic control and public information for lengthy incidents like hazardous material spills, fatality investigations, multiple vehicle accidents, and overturned tractor-trailer incidents. And reposition to minimize traffic impacts or demobilize promptly after transport, completed extrication, or extinguishment. Remember, this training session does not encompass all possible scenarios. It just shows the best practices for the most common types of situations you'll encounter. I know personally how important this information is. I can't emphasize enough how crucial these procedures are to ensuring your safety, as well as the safety of your colleagues in the traveling public. We're all supposed to protect and serve. I no longer have the ability to help implement these policies at the scene of an incident, so I am counting on you to carry them out for me and my co-workers still in the field. Apply them as soon as you leave the training today, and you'll be doing your part to protect your community and the people who make it great.